Our responsive scripture reading today is taken from Revelation 11, verse 19 to chapter 12, verse 17. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a, for a time and times and half a time. together in unison. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Today, Pastor LB will be bringing us God's message. Before he comes up, uh, let's say a prayer for the children before they leave for their classes. Let us pray. Dear God, we know that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate our children from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We pray that you will guard their minds and hearts and let them put their trust in you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Elby. Very good morning to one and all. It's good to see all of you in church on Chinese New Year. 
Uh, pardon my lack of faith, I would have, uh, I was expecting a thinner crowd, uh, but 8.30 was quite full and so is 10.30. And the singing, the praising was so, so rousing. I was so touched by the worship just now. Mm. Well, uh, being Chinese New Year, cannot afford not to do it. One, two, three. Sing Nian Meng En. Oh, uh, <laughs> now, let's turn around and greet each other. Come. <laughs> yes. Now, I need your help. Okay. Um, there's a, every Sunday, there's this special group of uh, our friends, dear friends who are joining us via live stream. Uh, and today, there are 20 of us still uh, joining us via live stream who are confined to home. Uh, maybe let's greet them. Sing Nian Meng En, Kwai Ai Zhu, Gan Zhen, Da Da Shen, Hao Bu Hao. Bu Da Shen, Bu Go Da Shen, Bu Suan Hoi. Okay, for you, those of you who are worshiping us, uh, jo- joining us via live stream, one, two, three. I have arranged to visit some of you in the week ahead, okay? Now, the rest of you, I'll try to visit you, okay? Mm, maybe let's pray, come. Father, we thank you that this Chinese New Year's Day, uh, we can be found in your house to worship you. We give you thanks for the year past, for the abundance of blessings that you showered upon us. Uh, as we give thanks to you, we also want to respond with our life in thanksgiving that in the year ahead, grant us, Lord, the grace as we have sung to live for you, to proclaim with our mouth and more so with our life, worthy is the Lamb. In his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> yes, coincidentally, today's passage is on the dragon. And yes, this is also the Chinese New Year, Year of the Dragon. But no, the preaching team didn't plan for the coincidence. (laughs) That somehow or other, we started our Revelation series in the first week of August last year. Then we paused on the third week of November for the Christmas sermon series and then January, our vision series. And last week, we resumed with an overview of Revelation again to warm us up. And this week, somehow or rather, on the calendar, uh, second day of Chinese New Year, Sunday, and we happen to be preaching on Revelation 12, on the dragon, on CNY Dragon Year. Uh, But personally, I'm really convinced that coincidences are really God's hand in the glove of history that somehow on this week we'll be covering Revelation 12 on the dragon. Personally, for me, it may be just God's way of trying to catch our attention. Maybe God wants to speak to some of us this morning, or maybe God wants to speak to all of us here as a corporate body in Zion Bishan. While we do not get too enamored or fearful about the Chinese dragons, or for that matter, English dragons, uh, we must be mindful about the biblical dragon in today's passage. And perhaps, as I said, today's coincidental passage is really God's reminder that the Christian faith has a spiritual dimension. That as we live in the humdrum of every day, unseen to our eyes, something else is happening. Something more powerful, something more insidious is working in and around us and where we are not careful, it might just work in our minds, in our hearts and in our lives. As Paul wrote so clearly that the most important Christian battles are really the ones in heavenly places. And that's exactly how today's passage began. It began with the holy war in heaven. Now remember, 
that when John wrote the book of Revelation, Christianity was exploding and Christianity's growth was threatening the Romans and Rome's sense of security. So they started to persecute Christians. In fact, John was exiled on the island of Patmos when he wrote Revelation. But things were going to get a lot, a lot worse soon for Christians in those days. Rome's big knife is going to come down hard, very hard, on Christians in those days. So God showed John three things. The what, the why, or the who, and the why. What will happen? Who are the people involved? And why do the people of God suffer? Just so that to encourage God's people in those days, as it is for our time, what is ahead. But rest assured, the victory is won. And it's also a reminder to us and to John's contemporary that it, is always, it has always been a cosmic battle between God and Satan. But if I may jump to the end, as read, Satan has been defeated because of the finished work of Christ. God's people, you and I, we need only to keep the commandments of God and to hold to the testimony of Jesus. So that's the big picture in today's passage. <clears throat> and the, as we read, it's kind of a messed up, right? You see dragons and then you see a woman giving birth and dragon come out, want to devour the baby. It seems a little bizarre. But as we come to understand all these little symbols, I believe you will, the picture will come out very clearly as we'll go forward. So the vision began with a great sign of a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And then we are told she was pregnant, and she was feeling a lot of pain and in the throes of birth, birth pangs. So the big question is, who is this woman? What does the sign mean? And very often, when it comes to symbols in the New Testament, especially Revelation, it will help if you remember back in the Old Testament, some parallel corresponding passages quite similar, and we will find one in Genesis chapter 37, which has the same description. If you remember, Joseph had a dream. He told his family that he dreamt that the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to him. And Joseph's father, Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel, he correctly interpreted that the sun and moon were Joseph, uh, Jacob himself and his wife, the sun and the moon. And then the 11 stars together with Joseph would make the 12 sons of Israel. Sun, moon, 12 stars. <clears throat> and they will be the first family. And from this family will grow the nation of Israel. And from the nation of Israel, a child will be born. Who is that child? Now, before we get to that, then we read in verses 3 and 4 that another sign appeared in heaven. And there was a great red dragon who wanted to devour the woman's child. Again, who was this dragon and why did he want to devour the child? And this one, don't need to guess because if you read down verses 9 and 10 in your Bible, it will say that the dragon, the great red dragon is the ancient serpent, the devil and Satan. Now, the ancient serpent is really an echo, again, throw back to the Old Testament, of Genesis 3, where this serpent tempted Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, resulting in her fall and God's judgment on her and humankind. But as we read on the screen, the woman's 
offspring, the child. Who might that be? Christ, the Messiah, will bruise the serpent's head, meaning he will defeat the serpent, but more importantly, he will reverse the curse of the fall. That's why the dragon wanted to devour the child. That's why we read of Israel, the woman, going through pains, birth pangs, throughout history. Exodus, they were subjected to slavery, and then they were, the nation of Israel were exiled. And in the New Testament, when Jesus was born, Herod was waiting to kill him and even executed all the babies just to prevent this child from reversing the curse. I mean, we read the description of the dragon. It's quite funny. Eh? Uh, it's a seven heads face with red. And I once heard a Hokkien pastor how he explained this look of the dragon. He said, uh, face red, red, bin ang ang, always angry. <laughs> and then seven heads means got a lot of face. So the, this dragon like to show off, like his face. Jin ai bin zhu, he said. Mm. Then got this uh, ten horns. Uh, he like to fight. Jin ai xiu pa. Then got this seven diadems or crowns. Means he always want to win. Tiam tiam ai nia, he said. <laughs> well, I think we get the point. The description of Satan, that he is ruthless. Never forget that. He is ruthless. He's so ruthless that we read that he swept a third of the stars to earth when he knew he was going to be defeated. And I suspect that was Satan's kamikaze attempt. Even if I die, we die together. Maybe if I can sneak in a little application here. My friends, never give the evil one a foothold. He will sweep you off in entirety. And that is why we read in verses 5 and 6, the birth of the male child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now, the term with a rod of iron, again, in the Old Testament, Psalm 2, is a reference to Psalm 2, where God promised his son who will defeat Satan and restore his people through his birth, through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, and will conquer Satan once and for all in his second coming. Much as the dragon wanted to devour Swallowing him in death, Satan was unable to because God caught the child up to his throne. So if you can see, verses 1 to 6 is really the Old Testament Genesis through to the Gospels, through to Revelation, compacted into one two-dimensional picture. And it is more importantly a reminder to us that there is much more happening than the humdrum of our everyday life. That where we are not careful, every decision that we make, every action that we take, every word that we speak, we might just, we might just be tricked to be used by the evil one. There is a cosmic better happening and where humans fail utterly but God, he has won triumphantly and it was won through the very precarious journey where the heavenly Lord Jesus incarnated from earth from heaven to earth and he gave his life and he triumphed over death and he ascended back to heaven see the picture in verses 1 to 6 but then again Satan would not concede defeat that easily. 
And so we read, John next described the scene of Satan's defeat and how he ended up on earth, what he did, and to whom. Now, verses 7 and 9 says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his minions. I mean, we don't know how the war was fought, maybe with sword, spear, or maybe with tank and bazookas, we don't know. But we are told that Satan was defeated. How was he defeated? And that is the most important. As described in verses 1 to 6, Satan was defeated through the birth of the child. Herod was not able to kill him. He won. Satan was defeated through the life of the child. The wilderness deceptions and temptations were not able to overcome him. Satan was defeated through the death of the child. The cross and death were not able to make him give up. Satan was defeated through the resurrection of the child because death could not contain him. He rose victoriously. He walked out of the tomb. He walked out of death's mouth. And he ascended gloriously back to where he belonged, back to his heavenly throne and seated on the right hand of God. And then we read there that there was no longer any place for Satan and his minions in heaven and they were thrown down. Why? Now we need to know why there was no place for them in heaven because it's important for us to know. There were no place for them in heaven. It's more than they, they fought the fight, they lost, then they got to get lost. Now it's a lot more than that because verse 9 says Satan's names are the ancient serpent, the devil, Satan, and the deceiver. But there is yet another of Satan's name that we, names that we must not miss in verse 10. He's also called the accuser of our brothers and who accuses them day and night before God. We got a glimpse of that in the Job's account. But thankfully, Job proved Satan wrong. But the big picture is since the fall of Adam and Eve, Satan gained the right to accuse everyone before God. And I suspect most times Satan's accusations were right. God's people disobeyed. God's people failed time and again. And they proved Satan right. And we can imagine Satan as the prosecutor. Whenever he has a case, he will continue to be needed in the court of justice to continue to prosecute, to continue to accuse, to continue to be present in heaven before God to accuse God's people. Now imagine for me, with me now, Christ came, he is our defense lawyer. But he did something more. He paid our fines out of his own pocket. And when the fines are paid, there will be no more case, right? Case dismissed. Satan do not need to be appearing before God anymore. No more case for him to accuse and prosecute. And I really love what Paul wrote in Colossians here. Colossians 2. He said, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal, legal demands. And this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and puts them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Case 
dismiss. Satan, the prosecutor, has no more right to be present in God's court of justice. He can no longer accuse God's people. And as Paul captured it so succinctly and beautifully, he said there is now no more condemnation in Christ. We are free. Satan lost his place in heaven. And if you paid attention, notice how many times John said he was thrown down. It was John's way of saying that it is absolute, that the reversal of the fall is absolute, that God's people is saved, it is absolute, that Satan has got no more grounds to accuse God's people is absolute. No wonder John heard heaven breaking out in praise in verse 10. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and authority of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God and they have conquered Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony for they loved not their lives even unto death. I will come back to verse 11 later, but let's take a look at verse 12, which says, Satan was in great wrath. Why was he angry? Again, important for us to know. He was in great wrath because he knew his time was short. So he unleashed his fury and wars on God's people. Told you. Satan, if he dies, even if he dies, he wants to pull people along. And that, my friend, will explain why there is so much war, so much pain, so much struggles. Maybe some of you are experiencing betrayals, disappointments, and fallenness in this world. Even though we know that Christ has won the decisive victory. How to explain that? Because of Satan. And that is why for those of you who are suffering, especially those of you who are worshipping via live stream, that you are suffering for no rhyme or reason, know that it is the work of the evil one on earth. But rest assured that your salvation is already in heaven. And know also that the evil one's time is short. It's a limited time. I believe I have run through with you the 1,260 days divided by 30 days is three and a half years. The time, times, and half a time, one, two, one plus two, three, three plus half, three and a half, is an indication, a symbol, reminding God's people, or rather comforting God's people, that Satan's time is limited. And your suffering, too, is limited. And that's why we read in verses 13 to 17, Satan, Satan turning his anger towards the woman, the nation of Israel who gave birth to the child. That's why they suffered so much. But when God divinely intervened to protect them, Satan turned his wrath against the rest of the woman's offsprings. There will be God's people. There will be you and I. And they would explain why sometimes bad things happen to good people? Why sometimes things just happen out of the blue? Because Satan seeks to derail us from our faith. God, I believe in you. Why do you allow these things to happen to me? I hope this explains. You have heard the preacher saying, we are already in the last days, but not yet. That's because the dragon, Satan's time, is still not up. And as he liked to say, things will get worse, much worse, before they can get better. So my friends, leave no doubt that Satan is going to unleash even more of his destruction and deception, as will be described in greater detail in Revelation 13. But again, let us rest in this assurance that Satan was defeated. Christ has won. There is now no more condemnation 
for those who are in Christ. So after this series of, we are halfway through Revelation, I hope we, by now, if that notice, that John's concern was really less on when will it happen. It's not so much concerned about that. What he's more concerned about is when it happens. When it happens. Whether it is the little trials and temptations now, or when things get worse, much worse, will God's people be found ready? And when it happens, John also wants us to know, how do God's people get ready? Back to verse 11. How do God's people get ready for the trials and temptations in the humdrum of our everyday life, and especially when things get worse? He says, God's people conquer Satan by the blood of the Lamb. Remember, Satan is the accuser. Sometimes he will sow in your mind. You are not good enough. You can't meet God's standards. You can't overcome your weaknesses. See, you fall again. Maybe Satan even whispers into our minds, you're done. That's it. You better leave the church. And if that ever happened to you, if you ever feel or hear any doubts in your mind, in your heart, remember Christ's one. Satan was thrown down. The blood of the Lamb has cleansed and empowered you to withstand every trials, every temptations, every accusation. And secondly, God's people can conquer Satan by the word of their testimony. The other name of Satan is also the deceiver. He deceived Satan, causing the fall. And he tried to deceive the Lord Jesus in the wilderness so that the Lord Jesus will not be able to reverse the fall. Remember how the Lord conquered Satan? Through the word of God, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. And Satan will deceive God's people, you and I, just so that our lives will have no impact in the world for the gospel. <clears throat> but God's people need not be passive or always be on the defensive. We can be, as we are reminded by John, on the offensive by fighting the good fight of faith. We prepare in season or out of season to proclaim the word of truth and Christ the truth. You see, as it is, the deceiver hates truth, right? The deceiver hates truth. And the best way to conquer the deceiver is for God's people to preach the truth, to live out the truth, to win people to Christ. That's how we conquer the evil one. And hence, thirdly, God's people must be prepared to love not their lives even unto death. The NIV translated it as God's people must not shrink from death. I mean, think along with me. What was Satan's ultimate goal in tempting the Lord Jesus in the wilderness and in the Garden of Gethsemane? What was his ultimate goal? In tempting the Lord Jesus in the wilderness. Don't need to go to the cross. Just jump down from the temple. God will send his angel. Everybody say, wow, so powerful. People will say that you are God. Turn the stone into bread. Everybody, oh, you can make great miracle. Don't need to go to the cross. What was Satan's ultimate goal in tempting the Lord? is so that the Lord will choose life over death. Should the Lord choose life over death, 
that will be the ultimate victory for Satan. But the Lord's reply was, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. He chose death over denial. And that, my friend, is also the ultimate challenge for God's people. You see, in this world, there are always two tracks, as the Bible reminds us. For some people, things will only get better. I suspect that is most of us in Zion Vision. In fact, at the preaching team, we had a fair bit of struggle. When we talk about persecution, how can we make it relevant to Singaporeans, especially us in Zion Bishan, where most of us are middle class, enjoying life, smooth sailing successes. So the Bible reminds us that there's always two tracks. God will allow the weeds to grow, and God will allow the weeds to grow alongside. And in His time, He will come and gather what belong to Him and to cast away what do not. So that's also the ultimate challenge for God's people. Many believers in countries hostile to Christianity, they have to choose death or choose to deny Christ. But I've said, our challenges here in Zion Bishan, I believe is a lot more subtle. But Satan will be at his best in deception. Satan either makes us feel there is no danger of death or denial, and which will lead us into complacency. No danger. Or maybe Satan will have allowed us into following the ways of the earth in compromise. We are very comfortable going through every day, week in, week out. Self-preservation, self-interest. Could we have been caught in this trap of my life, my time, it's my money, it's my family, it's my faith, it's my principle, it's my agenda. You know, like the proverbial frog in the cooking pot, where we are not careful, Satan will just allow us into enjoying so much warmth and comfort in the things that we do that we fail to realize that we are actually being cooked in the very warmth and comfort that we so come to enjoy. So to conquer Satan, we must respond to Christ's call to take up our cross daily and follow him. Try it, lah. What does it mean to take up our cross daily and follow him? So John has an answer for us. That we will, <clears throat> that like Christ, we would each day in the morning before we leave our house, that we are determined, that we decide that today I'm going to live my life for Christ. And that when necessary, I'll be willing to lose my life, I'll be willing to lose my faith, faith, than to lose my faith. And it's only when we have made that decision that we will be able to live out each day through our words and actions, the life and the testimony of the Lord Jesus. And even if we are to suffer and even when we are to lose big time or even in the moment of our weaknesses, we fail, we sin. We can still remind ourselves that we can stand secure by the blood of the Lamb. That He has already redeemed us from condemnation. Remember, the evil one has no place in heaven to accuse any one of us. For that was how Christ conquered Satan. And that, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is how we conquer Satan. Now let us, I'll just pause here and allow us to respond before I close in prayer. You know your life situation but know also that God knows. Know also that the evil one has been defeated. And 
that you are free. God, you hear the prayer of your people. God, you know also each and every of the hearts that are in here, the lives that are sitting now in this sanctuary. Especially during this time of festivities, Lord, I want to pray especially for my dear brothers and sisters who may not find the occasion celebratory because of some family matters, health challenges, emotional challenges. At this day, as we hear of your assurance of the finished work of Christ, that Father, you grant in them the strength, the assurance, and the grace to press on, knowing that their salvation is assured. For those of us who are successful sailing through life, grant us also the grace to be able to discern the deception of the evil one, that we may not be drowned in his deceptions so much that we do not even know that we are being deceived, that we don't even know that we are straying away from you. So once again, whether we are doing well, or struggling, may your grace fill us. May your grace also grant us the strength to overcome and live a victorious life just like your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.